praise and honor. Many times we don't, we see the bad. It's much easier for our attention to get on the things that are negative. But if you begin to look at the positive things, man, it can sure cheer your day up a lot more because there are good things happening in this world. God is doing great things. And they're wonderful things. So don't miss the good. Don't miss revival in the air. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. God's moving. Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you for your presence being here this morning. We honor you. We, we surrender to you. We submit our hearts to you. And we ask you to have your way in this place. God, we thank you that revival fire is moving in our nation. We thank you, Lord, that you're awakening hearts. You're awakening lives. You're awakening families. I thank you, God, revival is happening in my heart. Revival is happening in individuals, Lord God, and in families and in homes, God. We know that revival is happening, Lord God, all across uh, this city, all across this nation. We, we thank you for it, God. We pray that the fire continues to catch. Lord, we pray that the fire continues to catch like a burning wildfire, Lord, and that the people of God begin to rise up like never before. And Father, I thank you that we're going to see a great and mighty harvest. Come on. Oh, yes, Lord. We thank you for a harvest of souls coming in, God. Lord God, everything that the enemy has meant for evil, Lord, you have a plan to make it for good. And we thank you, God, in Jesus' name. If anyone's got a shout in this place, go ahead and let it out, can you? Hey!
seen what you can do, oh God of wonders, your power has no things you've done before in greater measure you will do again cause there's no prison wall you can't break through no mountain you can move all things are possible there's no broken body you can't raise so that you can save things are possible the darkest night you can light it up you can light it up god of revival let hope arise death is overcome you've already won Why should my heart fear what you've defeated? I will trust in you alone. There's no reason wall you can't break through. No mountain All things are possible.
Every strong hope will come. I hear the chains hit the ground. God of revival, pour me out, pour me out. Let's speak this over our city.
With an endless passion, I want to burn for you, oh God. I want to burn for you. Oh, I want to burn hot. I want to burn bright. Yeah, I want to burn for you. I want to burn for you. For the glory. Breathe, come and breathe on the coals of my heart. Let a fire start. Me a place with a holy flame. That you, you will burn through me. Make me pure, God. Refine us, fire. My desire, God. I want to burn for you. I want to burn for you. You're the cause I stand for. You're the cause I live for. You're the cause I'll die for. The cause of Jesus Christ. Lord, it's you. Lord, it's you. Every hand be lifted. It'd be all right if we just began to set our hearts and our affections at the Lord. We trust you. We trust you. We trust you. You're coming back for a holy bride. We trust you in the fire. We trust you. You 
Hallelujah. Give a big old shout amen this morning. Hallelujah. Can I share something with you for just a moment? I sense some of you need a little encouragement today. Listen to this. I'm not a goldsmith, but I've learned a little something along the way talking to people a lot smarter than me. And this one guy was telling me about the purification process when it came to gold. And he talked about the melting point, Nicole. And he said, it's when gold reaches its melting point that the purification process begins to take place. Let me say that again. I said, this man, a lot smarter than me, said, when the purification process begins, it's when the gold reaches its melting stage. You see, what happens is that gold gets really hot, and it begins to to get to a temperature where the imperfections, the things that are toxic to the valuable, uh, I guess the, 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 the value rating of the gold, it begins to take away from it. So those imperfections, they come up to the top and they go and they leave and then that, that gold cools down and then its value, its original value it was intended for is there. This morning, if you're in the purification process and you feel like you're at your melting point, I've got some good news for you. You're just getting rid of all those toxic things that you weren't designed to have. Some of you, you may be at your breaking point or your melting point this morning where you're like, you know what, Dennis, I can't take anymore. You need to celebrate the fact that God is in that thing because he's taken all that junk that he didn't intend you to have and he's taken it away. Is it hot? Oh, yeah. It's hot. But you know what? I'd rather be hot now in the process of God than be hot in eternity, in eternity with the devil. Oh, yeah, this stuff is real. There's people that bankrupt their future here on earth and in eternity because they won't go through the process of God. We got this little thing we called a backslidden state. That's a believer that was right on a, once on the right path, but now they're not. If you're around us here too long, you're going to realize something. We aren't once saved, always saved here at The Rock. Now, do we believe the grace of God is more than we can comprehend? Absolutely. But he's not a man that he shall lie. The wages of sin are death. Something dies when we live in a manifested life of sin. But when we submit ourselves to the process of God, whoo, come on. All those things that we can't get rid of on our own, he purges. He burns. But you see, when God is in our pain, there's purpose. Turn to your neighbor and say, hey. Now, come on, wake him up. Say, hey. God is in my pain. So there's purpose. Oh, yeah, you better cheer about that this morning. Amen. Woo! Just lift your hands with me one more time before we transition. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you all over this place. Here in this sanctuary online, Lord, wherever people are tuning in, that, Lord, you're, you're taking them through the process. And, Lord, you're burning out all that junk, all the impurities inside of us, Lord, our stinking thinking. 
Lord, those areas in our heart that we've kind of tucked away that's comfortable, but Lord, it doesn't glorify you. Lord, today we ask you to, to let us see those places we, that we get that revelation of the areas, Lord, that we need more of you. Burn inside of us, Lord. Burn away the imperfections. But Lord, today we submit those things to you. And we thank you for all that you're doing in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody shout it. Amen. Amen. Woo! Well, it's good to see everybody this morning. Welcome back to the Rock Family Worship Center. If you are a guest here, thank you so much for being with us. And all of our tunes, all of our tunes, hey, yeah, all of our tunes, all of our friends tuning in this morning, we're glad you're with us. Welcome back. Amen? We're going to dismiss kids up to preteens right through those side doors. Amen. Well, how's everybody doing this morning? Ow! All right. That's not bad. That right there was like a West Virginia hillbilly praise the Lord. I like that. I like that. Well, it's good to see everybody. Now, listen, I know it's vacation season. It's been hot outside. We're kind of in the mode of, man, the kids may or may not be going back to school. What are we going to do? You need to put all that aside this morning and say, you know what? I'm tuning in. Say, I'm tuning in what God has. Yeah, keep it coming for me. All right. We're on the right track. Amen. Well, if you need an offering envelope this morning, raise your hands. One of our awesome, friendly, good-looking ushers will hook you up. Right, Tom? I'm talking about you. Hey, speaking of good-looking, we got a birthday boy in the house this morning. Where's Adam at? Adam working security? Yeah, well, if you happen to see Adam Wise, just wish him a big old happy birthday. He's old. He's like 34. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, just let's give our security team a big old warm welcome this morning. Amen. <laughs> These guys are always working behind the scenes under the leadership of Pastor Greg, and we are so thankful for all that they do. They're out there doing their stuff to make sure that we can do our stuff in here and be safe. Amen. Appreciate you guys. Well, why don't you guys come up this morning? If you would like to give online, our information is behind me. You can give via texting. You can give online through uh, our app on PushPay or our website. And I, I've been saying this for a while, but I want to prepare you because we change slow, right? We are changing the look of some things here coming up in the next month or so. I don't want to throw you off when you see something that's brand new. It's us, all right? We're going to be making some tweaks to the logo. We're going to be rebranding some things. We're going to be having a few new processes when it comes to online giving, but it's all to try to make things easier, and plus, well, we've had our look for a while. We're just going to change things up a little bit, amen? So don't worry about that when you see it. It's still the Rock Parkersburg, amen. Well, this morning, Lord, we just thank you for all that you're doing. What an awesome privilege it is to give to you. Lord, Heavenly Father, give us a revelation this morning what it is to build your kingdom, your house with the resources that you have given us, Lord. Every penny, every opportunity, Lord, we give it back to you. We thank you for that in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody shouted, amen. amen. Well, guys, pass the baskets. few things to share with you. We are one week away, one week from today. We are going to be celebrating our 20th year anniversary right here in Parkersburg. Amen. <laughs> Woo! Well, what does that mean? Well, for you, that means free lunch after service in the gymnasium. It's going to be great. I mean, we're putting out a full spread for the kiddos. We've got a bunch of inflatables and things. They're going to be just on that end of the property in the grass area that we have not paved yet. And we just want you to come. We're going to have a great service. We're going to have some great fellowship afterwards. And it's a time just to say, my gosh, look what the Lord has done. And just meet some people and you know what, if you're new, maybe you've been here for six months, maybe you've only been here a few hours, this morning is it. We would love to have you come be a part of that. So that's next Sunday. 
And also, ladies, I believe we have your next We Are meeting coming up, right? Pastor Karen's going to be coming and sharing from The Rock, Jackson, Ohio. It's going to be awesome. And that is when? September 12th. That's not that far away. That's just short of a month. So if you want to be a part of that, there's a Facebook sign-up so you can register. It's free, but you can just let them know you're coming. And we would love to have all of our ladies in the house for that. And last, we have a bunch of sign-up sheets at the Welcome Center. And we are going to schedule things very soon for those sign-up sheets. We have a baby dedication. We have a membership Sunday. And then we have a water baptism. So stay tuned for that. We'll let you know when those are scheduled. But we'd love for you guys to be a part of those if you can. Amen? Well, are you ready for a good word today? Well, I am too. Let's welcome Pastor Dave. Come on up. Hallelujah. Good morning, everybody. Man, you all got me up early this morning. Either the worship team was sleepy, you were sleepy, or Dennis was short-winded. I don't know what it was. Or maybe one of all three. Y'all were kind of lethargic this morning. Amen. You're not going to be that way now, are you? I mean, your favorite preacher's up here. Hopefully. Hopefully. One of them anyway, right? One of them. Hallelujah. Well, this morning we're going to do part two of the blood covenant, the blood covenant. And uh, last week we uh, got into this, and we, of course, our foundational scripture for this is in Revelation chapter 12. We found out that they overcame him, that would be the devil, by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives even unto death. Amen. And we're in a process of trying to convert people into losing their life to gain their life eternal. We got a lot of people wanting to hold on to life on planet Earth. We got a lot of people wanting to say, well, can't I have my cake and eat it too? Can I have the world and Jesus? No. Sorry. You got to pick, you got to choose a master. Jesus told us, choose you this day, who will you serve? And today, because the American gospel has been, I believe, you know, or let me say it this way, the gospel of Jesus Christ has been misrepresented a lot in America and really around the world. It's not just America. I mean, it's Europe. It's, it's all over. But we've seen a different commitment in the people of God in this present generation than we saw in earlier generations. In the time of Jesus, when you accepted him as Lord and Savior, that meant you lived for him and good chance was you'd die for him or be imprisoned for him. But people were willing to give it all. And one reason they were willing to give it all is because they knew the stakes. But in about 1975, 1980, there was a shift in the preaching of the gospel in America. Preachers stopped talking about eternal judgment. Preachers stopped talking about hell and the lake of fire. Preachers stopped talking about people going to these places. In fact, you know, I've been now a full-time pastor for 34 years. And in that 34 years, I've never stopped preaching on the judgment of God as well as the mercy of God. But a lot of people have stopped preaching on the judgment of God because of that, there's not much of a fear of the Lord in our culture. I say it this way. Church today is about like a Disney movie where all dogs go to heaven. But that's not what the Bible says. So what we're doing in this series is we're reminding you or maybe teaching you for the first time what it means to be in a blood covenant with God. 
And last week, if you weren't here, I encourage you to go back online and watch it because I'm not going to re-preach it all again. Although I could because you probably forgot 80% of what I said. Amen. I could preach the same thing I preached last week, and a lot of people would say, that's good. And I'm like, yeah, but we said that last week. Oh, I didn't remember that. And that's just the way humans learn. That's not wrong. It's just how we learn. We learn by repetition. We, we learn things that way. And sometimes God will just illuminate one thing. The Holy Spirit will bring one thing up in our spirit. So last week we talked about the blood covenant in history. And the Hebrew language is a beautiful language. The ancient Hebrew is a language of pictures, numerical values, letters, and symbols. And God designs everything for a purpose. When we get to the end of our lives and we go through our life review with God, we'll find out everything that happened to us had a reason. We don't always see it when we're in the middle of it. In fact, you could probably go back 10 years, visit very difficult times in your life, and 10 years forward, you now understand the reason what happened, why it happened. Now, there may be some mysteries you never understand until you stand before God and he gives you the full review. But for most of us, we've had those times where I don't understand, I don't understand, and then fast forward five years, oh, I know exactly why that happened. Amen. God was dealing with me, like, like Pastor Dennis was saying earlier. When we're in a meltdown, we don't realize God's just trying to bring the toxic things to the surface so he can clear them out. There's stuff in us we don't know what's in us. We see a lot of believers who are all strong in faith until a tribulation occurs, and they have a meltdown, and we find out your faith was so shallow it couldn't even bring you through a small test. So we looked at the words in the Hebrew for the word covenant. Jesus said, this is my blood in this new covenant. And the Hebrew word covenant is berit, and it's made up of three syllables, if you will, bar, e, and tav. Bar, e, and tav. And it literally means this. When God, and also it, it's also the same word that is the word create, covenant and create. So the very words of God are made up of this. When he says covenant, he's saying, this is my pure, capable son cut and sacrificed for you. That's what the word. So clear back before man had ever sinned, God had already put all this into play. And so when we look at these things, we went through Genesis and we looked at the ancient covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, and a lot of those things. And today we're going to go now and pick up in the New Testament. We're going to go back and, and see how this is laid out. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 1. We're going to start there. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and earthly sanctuary. For the tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which was called the holiest of all. And I don't have time to teach on the tabernacle this morning, but you can go and do a little study yourself if you've never studied it. But the tabernacle was laid out into the entrance, which was the outer court. And then you came into what we call the holy place. And that's where he's talking about now, where the lampstand was and the table. And then you cross through the veil into the holy of holies. Now... And above it, well, let me see, which, okay. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, or the holy of holies, which had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid on all sides with gold, in which the golden pot that had the manna 
Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak now in detail, which is what I just said. Now, when these things had thus been prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But in the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance, and the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. So under this old covenant, this old blood covenant, the priest only one time a year the, on the, this day of atonement would come in and he would bring pure blood from an animal that had been killed in the sacrifice. And he would bring that blood in. First of all, he had to pay for his own sins. And he would put it on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant and that would give them one year's forgiveness of sins. Not only for him, but for the sins of the people, even the sins committed in ignorance presumptuous sins. So this blood offering happened once a year, but the very fact that the priest had to offer it for himself and that the priest had to come every year, we learn here that this is showing that it was not complete. It was not fulfilled. It was temporary. So now we see in verse 11, the new covenant begins but Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come with greater and a more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal Redemption. Now we see here that when, when Moses was commanded to build this tabernacle in the wilderness, which was this tent that we're talking about, over and over Moses was told, see to it that you make it according to the pattern. Because the scripture teaches that just as Moses made this tabernacle on earth, it was made according to a pattern that was actually in heaven. So we had the earthly tabernacle, and the process of worship was happening there. But in truth, there's a heavenly tabernacle, and the blood of animals could never go through to the heavenly tabernacle. So just as the high priest came and put his blood on the mercy seat, in the same way, Jesus, and we talked about last week when Mary came at the tomb and she tried to embrace him, he said, don't cling to me yet because I've not yet ascended to my father and your father, to my God and your God. He had not yet carried the blood to the heavenly tabernacle and put on the eternal mercy seat. You remember there was a group of people in Israel, I'm trying to remember the, the, the name of the king that was ruling then, but they had recovered the Ark of the Covenant. And at one time, they wanted to make sure that the Philistines who had had the covenant, they wanted to make sure, I think it was Ekron, but they wanted to make sure the Philistines who had had the covenant, wanted to make sure they hadn't stolen anything out of it, which was inside the rod that budded, the table of law, and the manna. They wanted to make sure it wasn't taken. They took the mercy seat off. And God was so angered because they looked on the law without the blood 
that 50,000 people died. Judgment started that quick. You look on the law without blood and you're dead. That's how serious this covenant is with God. You can't come before him without blood. Your sin has to be paid for by blood. And if you don't have that deep inside you, you will look at the blood as a common thing. And last week, we looked at how serious an offense it was that we were never allowed to eat anything with blood in it. All meat had to be drained of blood before we were allowed to eat it. And that goes through today. Why? Because God said the life of the flesh is in the blood, and he would never allow the blood to be a common thing. The blood is so important to God, guys. And we've got to have it just as important to us. Because every time I knowingly move into an act of sin, I know that I am offending Jesus' blood that he purchased my innocence with. I don't want to ever look at that blood. And, and I don't, you know, it's one thing. And I, I did this little illustration a while back maybe a year or two ago, I, I, I brought up a little child and I stood him in front of you and I said, now you're about to be tempted. You're about to be tempted and you know this temptation is wrong and you know it's sin, but man, it's just too good to pass up. And then you're probably gonna fall in this temptation and you know, well, you'll, you'll repent when it's over, you know. I said, but what would happen if I brought one of your children up here? And I said, now, the minute you say yes to the sin, I'm going to shoot your child in the head and kill him or her. Go ahead and sin, but your child dies. Would sin take on a different meaning? You think you'd have, people say, I just can't stop. You think you could stop? You think you could stop if you knew your child was going to die if you did it? Amen. We've got to have that kind of an attitude toward the blood of Christ. An innocent man died. Without his blood, you have no hope. Without his blood, there's no redemption. There's no salvation. There's nothing for you. You are eternally lost as an eternal criminal. Unless you have his blood. And so every time we knowingly and willingly move into an area of sin, the blood is crying, don't do it. I died so you don't have to do this anymore. And that's how we got to look at it. The blood still speaks. You can't go in without blood on you. When that death angel moved over Egypt, they were told, it's called the Passover because the death angel passed over the homes of those who put the blood on their doorposts and on the lintel of their door. They put the blood of a sacrificed lamb, a lamb without spot and blemish. And then they had to cook the lamb, and they were told to eat the lamb with bitter herbs. And they had to eat every part of the lamb. Not one part was allowed to be disposed of. Because God wanted us to know, and that's why we preach the full gospel. We can't take out the part of the lamb we don't like. And it's bitter sometimes. It's hard. I don't like looking at people and say, you're going to hell if you don't repent. I don't like, how many of y'all feel that yucky in your stomach when you see someone standing on the street with a sign saying, repent or burn? A lot of us say, oh, but it's the truth. We don't want to see that as Americans. It's like we don't want to see our chicken killed, plucked, and cut up. We just want to see it deep fried. <laughs> Ain't a chicken no more. But what if you had to go out and catch the chicken? Do you know that when the father brought the lamb for sacrifice to the, to the priest for his family every year, 
When he brought that lamb, he had to hold the lamb while the priest slit its throat. And he had to hear the lamb scream. And he had to hear the lamb gurgle in its own blood. And he had to watch that lamb die and give up its life so that his family could have life one more year. Be different if you had to come in here every service and kill an animal at the door to get in. That's what they had to do. Because God wanted them to understand the penalty of sin is death. And we look at sin today as though it's nothing. We look at it as it's nothing. Well, you know why people are sinning so much? Because they don't believe what I'm saying this morning. They have no blood to restrain them. They hear not a lamb screaming. They don't see a Savior hanging on a cross, gasping for breath, saying, My Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me? They don't see the cat of nine tails ripping his flesh apart. They don't see his bones being dislocated as he lunged up to catch another breath of air. They don't feel the nails coming in their hands. They have no value of the blood. And that's why they jump in sin to sin to sin to sin and then run in church. Hallelujah. I want to come to church knowing I'm a bloody man every time I walk in the doors. I want to walk in such fear of God. I want to repent for even thinking about something, let alone doing it. If you're not repenting of your thoughts yet, You've still not grabbed hold of the power of the blood. The Bible says the blood of bulls and goats, we just read, it can't take care of the conscience. But the blood of Jesus is so powerful, it can even cleanse your conscience. That's why the hymn writer said, Oh, what, what happened today? My, the weight of my sin rolled away. We got to make a lot about the blood. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? We got Christians that, well, do we feel like worshiping God today? Oh, no, I'll just stay home, watch online. I just don't feel like it today. What about the blood? You think he felt like hanging on a cross for you? Where's your sacrifice of worship? Don't yell at me, Dave. It's not that big of a deal. Yes, it is. It's a big, bloody deal. And I'm passionate about it. For this reason, he's the mediator of a new covenant by means of death. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also be a necessity of the death of the testator. A will is not in force until the person dies. When we say the last will and testament, the new covenant, the new covenant, the new testament, our inheritance became ours, but Jesus had to die for that to happen. Man, I just want to be able to convince you before you yield, before you become another lazy Christian, before you become another lethargic worshiper, before you just absolutely look at the blood of Christ as a common thing, I want you to walk in knowing every day, but for the blood of Christ, I'm a dead man, but for the blood of Christ, I'm an eternal criminal, and I'm going to an eternal prison called the lake of the fire which was created for the devil and his angels God is not who you serve in convenience he's not a God that you serve in convenience 
He's not a God that you serve when you got, when the world's offering nothing better this morning. Should we go to church today? I don't know. Anything else going on? Well, we could run to the mall. Let's have a picnic. Then we don't have to go to church. I remember a precious lady I pastored 25 years ago, and she, she had the appearance of one that loved God, and she was always missing church. And I asked one day, I said, why, why are you always missing church? She said, Pastor Dave, my children, every time I get ready to go to church, they show up at my house, and I can't leave them. I looked at her, and I said, your children are your idols, Mama. Your children are your idols. You need to tell your children, your dad and I are going to church. Now, you're welcome to come with us. We'll be back in two hours, and then you can come see us. But don't you dare show up at my house again when you know your dad and I are going to worship the living God and to honor the blood that was shed for our sins. How dare you dishonor our covenant with God by showing up when you know it's time for us to go worship God. That's what you tell your little idol-worshiping children. Mom and dad, don't put your children ahead of God. Don't you ever put your children ahead of God. Say, so you're being tough today. Yeah, I am. Because someone died for you. Act like it. Walk around here and act like someone died for you. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both on the book itself and all the people, saying, The blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Without shedding of blood, everything's purified with blood. Your worship is purified with blood. Your Living holy is purified with blood. Your witness is purified with blood. Your whole life is to be purified with blood. So every time you put your hand or you let your feet take you somewhere or you let your mouth speak of something, you ought to ask, is this purified by blood? Is where we're going or about what we're about to do or where we're about to stay or what we're about to say, is it purified with blood? Or are we calling the blood of Christ a common thing? Our service has to be purified with blood, even in the house of God. You know how we dishonor the God? You know how we dishonor the blood? Oh, I got to do this today in church. Oh, I got to do this today in church. You dishonor the blood. You dishonor the the Bible says everything you do, whether in word or deed, you do it as unto the Lord. That means you do it with blood. You serve as if your service is paid for in blood. I want to preach like a bloody man. I want to preach through the filter of the blood. Backsliders hate this kind of message. They're like, you're making me feel yucky inside. You are yucky inside. That's why you need the blood. But when you got a pure conscience, you can endure hard preaching, I'll tell you that. But when your conscience is defiled because you've dishonored the blood, you feel yucky when a preacher gets strong. Come on, somebody. I don't want to offer anything up less than what would honor his blood when I talk about it. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of these things should be purified. 
with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made without hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He would have then have to have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who wait eagerly for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Jesus walked into heaven. The Bible just said it. For you, for I, and he came with blood. He carried your name in his blood. And he said, this blood makes them clean. And the father said, I accept your sacrifice, and I will release them from judgment. Now, we got to honor that blood with everything that's within us. And we can't ever forget he had to die because of our sin. That's why the Bible says very clearly, how can you continue in sin? How can you just continue in sin? I can't. Why? Because the blood still speaks. blood still speaks. Matthew 26, 26. Let's look at this again. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to the disciples saying, take eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he extended that cup to them he extended that cup to them saying drink from it all of you I want to come in every day saying I drank from the blood today I want to wake up tomorrow morning saying I'm a bloody man I drink from the blood today. Every time someone starts to do something and you feel that old man rising up inside you, take a drink from the blood. And remember, Jesus died. The next time you want to hate, the next time you want to be embittered, the next time you want to fail in a temptation, just stop and say, I take a drink. See him offering His blood again. Drink it. Drink all of it. It's for the remission of sins. And then he said this. But I say to you, I will not drink of this vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, let's take another look from a different angle at the blood covenant. See, everything God did has to do with blood. Do you know, women, that when God designed you to reproduce, God designed you. Now, God had to have a perfect blood to offer as a sacrifice. We just read animal blood wouldn't do it. All men's blood was tainted. So when God decided, before he created us, he decided and put this plan in place because he knew what we were going to do. But he knew to have a free will agent as his sons and daughters 
there was always the risk of free will. How many of y'all have felt maybe, especially you younger people, when you see the mess this world is in right now, you've had that, that concern about, should we even bring children into this world? Come on. I had it when my babies, before my babies were born, because back then we were facing Y2K, you know, the, we thought Jesus was coming then. And I, I remember thinking, do I want to bring in children that will have to face the Antichrist? Would it be better just not to have? There's always a risk with children. You don't know what they're going to do. And as they develop and grow, the last thing you want is a child that breaks your heart. But God has a whole world of children that broke his heart. And so God made a way. Now, he knew we were apt to fail. So when he created woman, he designed her body that she could bring forth other humans. And in this system he designed for her, he put a barrier. And it's very complex from what I've read about it. Very, Dr. Barb here could probably explain it better than I can, but it's a very complex blood barrier. The blood of a mother never, ever intermingles with the child that she carries. The child in the uterus, there is a transmission of oxygen and food and waste without the blood ever mingling. And there's a bunch of these like filters in the placenta and the uterus that cause this division because God knew in the future, once man sinned, he would have to be able to bring himself into flesh with pure blood. And if the baby's blood touched the mother's blood, the blood would be tainted. And the redemption couldn't happen. He could never be a man. So he actually designed you ladies that the blood would never touch or intermingle. So the father's blood does. You know what the first trace of life is? It's not a heartbeat. It's blood. Did you ever break open a chicken egg and you saw those little red streaks in it in the yolk something happened there something went wrong when a embryo is fertilized the blood then the heart the heart's designed before the mind the brain so God designed it all this way so now he takes this virgin who has an egg without mama's blood. And he says, that which is of you shall be of the Holy Ghost. God put an eternal, immortal, pure seed of himself to cause that fertilization that become Jesus Christ. Man's blood never touched it. So the blood of Christ was pure. That's why only he, without a virgin birth, there could be no redemption. Think about it. I mean, this thing, when you start getting into the, the red thread, from the time the Rahab, the harlot, was told to drop a red cord over the wall of Jericho that her and her household could be saved, because she chose loyalty to the children of Israel and their God over the God of the, 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 Philist, the Philistines or whatever they were back then. She put that red scarlet cord. Everywhere you see blood, you see the picture of our salvation. Everywhere. So, Jesus goes through this ritual at the Last Supper. And he speaks about things all through the Gospels. That if you don't understand what I'm going to tell you next, you miss the story. I, I remember when we learned this stuff back in Bible college, and I need to preach it more because I just forget that most people don't know this. But, you know, when you get, to com when you get common knowledge of something, you just kind of assume everyone else knows it. But they don't. 
Okay. If you want to understand this blood thing a little deeper, let's talk about a wedding. Let's talk about marriage. If you were Hebrew, you would know a lot of what I'm going to say right now. If you'd been schooled in the Hebrew rituals of the ceremony of marriage. So here's how a marriage worked, and I'm going to just skim through it. There are deeper details, but I don't have time for today. All right. So a man wanted to marry a, a woman. So he would talk to his father and then talk to her father, and they would meet at the city gates with the elders of the city where legislation where laws were passed where government established in a community as they met together they would have a contract or an agreement drew up it was a negotiated contract and the young man his father would offer the father of the bride a dowry and it was an agreed upon payment for the bride she had to be purchased not that she was owned, but she had to be bought with a price, okay? Now, in the agreement, once they come down to a conclusion of the father of the bride would say, yes, I accept the payment for my bride, my daughter, for your bride. I accept the payment. The father accepts the payment for the bride. The contract or the covenant which would be blood, had to be negotiated. So if they came to an agreement, the groom would take a cup of wine, which is symbolic of what? Blood, just like our little grape juice cups, symbolic of blood. And he would drink of the, the cup. And after hearing all the negotiations, and the negotiations included things like this, Will my daughter be allowed to own property or will she not be allowed to own property? Also included in the dowry was money that would be kept by the father of the bride in case the husband was killed in battle or even divorced her that when she returned back to her father, he would have money to take care of her and possibly her children. That was all negotiated into the contract rights and so once they agreed and the bride had heard all this she heard it all then the groom would take the cup of wine with two hands and he would extend it to her she had her choice at this point even though marriages seemed to be prearranged there was the free will of the bride Once she had heard everything, once the fathers had agreed with the groom, it was still her choice whether to enter the covenant or not. Now, if she took the cup, she would drink it. At that moment, she was betrothed, which legally meant she was married. Okay? She was married. By all legal... From that moment forward... They had to be a bill of divorcement if they broke up because they were legally espoused. Now, once she drank of the cup, the groom would drink of the cup, and then he would hold up the cup, and he would say, I will not drink from this cup again until she is with me in my father's house. And he would take the cup back to his father's house, and there he would hide it. And he would not drink from that cup again until the ceremony of marriage was completed. Then the bride had the job of preparing her and the bridesmaids' wedding garments. And so she would spend the next, it was approximately a one-year engagement. She would spend the next year going from town to town collecting 
valuable fabrics. And she and her mother and her bridesmaids would begin to sew the wedding garments for the wedding party. And each person invited to the wedding was given a special garment. It was a very costly, lengthy process. You know, you know what it is, going and getting fitted and going back and getting fitted again. And then the bridesmaids all complaining because you chose the most expensive dress in the shop. I had three daughters. You know how many weddings they've been in? They, they could have made a movie with my daughters, you know. Always a bridesmaid, never a bride, that whole thing, you know. And if you got cute kids, I'm sorry. Because they're going to be walking up the aisle bearing rings and dropping flower petals at every wedding in the church because they're cute. If you've got photogenic kids, you're done, right? So the groom at that point would tell the bride, I'll return to you on the appointed day. But the problem is no one knew when that would be because only the father of the groom could determine the time of the wedding, and it would be held secret until the announcement. So here's the father of the groom, and he goes back with his son, and his son begins to build a room on the side of the father's house that would become his bride's home. And so it would take him approximately a year to do it. So during this next year period, the bride was taking care of her clothing and the groom was building their house. Now, and when the groom felt like the house was completed, he would invite his father to come and inspect it. And his father had the sole power to say, it's fit for the bride or it's not. And until it passed his inspection, nothing proceeded any further. Once the father said, it is finished, at that point, everyone knew the wedding was imminent, but yet no one knew the day or the hour. So at that point, the bridesmaids, the bridal party would move in to the bride's home, and from that moment forward, they would sleep in their bridal clothes because they had to be ready at a moment's notice. They would have to have their lamps full of oil and their wicks trimmed so that at the middle of the night, they could get up if the father called during the night. The groom and his groomsmen would move in together into the father's house, and there they would wait day after day, not knowing when. And typically, at some hour past midnight, the midnight hour, the father would come, and he would wake up the groom, and the groom would wake up the groomsmen, and they would... Ready themselves, the groomsmen would take ram's horns, and the groomsmen would take a litter, you know, what you carry people in, a litter or a stretcher, a seated litter, and they would march to the bride's house, blowing the horn that everyone who had been invited and given a wedding garment must join in the procession as they went. When they reached the bride's house... The groom would take the bride, sweep her up, set her on the litter, and she would be lifted up. And she would be carried in the air. It was called in tradition the flying of the bride. She would be carried in the air to the house of the groom that he had prepared for her. Along the way, anyone that didn't awaken or wasn't prepared, didn't have their garment on, was left behind. And everyone that came along this process 
would, the father would stand at the door and the father would welcome the wedding party into the house. As soon as the last member of the procession entered, he closed the door and sealed it and said, no one else may enter for seven days. Then the bride and the bridegroom would go into the bridal chamber to consummate the marriage while the best man stood at the door and guarded. When the consummation was complete, the groom would come forth with linen that had blood on it to, number one, prove that his spouse was a virgin, and number two, to show that he had consummated the marriage. And so blood was shed and pain. So in man, we have the doctrine of circumcision, which is blood, cut, and pain. And in women, we have the breaking of the hymen, which is blood, cut, and pain. And that is the blood covenant of marriage. And for seven days was the wedding supper and the wedding feast. And for seven days, that's all they did was eat. And I'm sure the bride and the groom snuck away every once in a while. (laughs) To practice. (laughs) They were practicing how to have children. So now when we look at that picture... When we look at that picture, we see so many things. Now, every Galilean, as Jesus was standing on the hillsides telling stories, and as Jesus extended the cup to his disciples and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, drink it, and I won't drink of this cup again until I bring you to my father's house. See, they knew what he was saying. Because they all went to weddings. Jesus' first miracle was at a wedding that he and his family had been invited to, remember? You had to be invited to a wedding. You couldn't be a wedding crasher in Hebrew. In the Hebrew culture, wedding crashers got rocked. Literally. All right. (laughs) Now let's go to Matthew 22, verse 1. Jesus answered and spoke to them in, again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. You know what? Ooh. Not everyone's invited. Do you know what privilege it is to be invited? Whew. And again, he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, see, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it, went their own ways, one to his farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, and treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, and he destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. And he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, let me tell you something. This life you're living right now is to find out if you're worthy. Your worship of him is your proof of worth. Don't take that invitation lightly. Don't take it lightly. We have no fear of God. We've taken the invitation lightly. Oh, I can go to a wedding anytime I want. Oh, you think so? 
So the servants went out into the highways, or he said, therefore the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they'd found, both bad and good. Folks, this is a picture of God inviting his children of Israel, and they didn't want to come, so he went to America. He went to Europe. He went to Turkey. He went to India. He went to South America. Strangers to the covenants we were called. Gentiles we were called. Because all the sons, the natural sons of Abraham weren't that interested in coming. Oh, they'd been to weddings before. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? Because that was one of the purposes of the father as he watched the door to make sure that every invited guest came in the garment because price was paid for that garment. You don't just show up in any old rag to a wedding. You know, I started watching our culture disintegrate years ago when people started coming to weddings in tank tops and flip-flops and shorts. And I started grieving inside as I said, we've lost honor, my God of everything. And he was speechless. And the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Look, many are called. And this is where we got to recognize just because you were called doesn't yet mean you were chosen. I wrestled with this verse for years when I got saved. When I started preparing for ministry, God, what does that mean? What does that mean? And as I matured in Christ, he showed me very clearly the invitation's been given. But there's so many that don't take that invitation seriously. The chosen are the ones who get the wedding garment. Their robes are washed white in the blood of the lamb. Their, their lamps are full of oil. And their wicks are trimmed. And they're sleeping in the house. And they're wedding. They're ready at the sound of the trump, at the sound of the horn. They're ready to fly. They're ready to go. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. For do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. Now, when you understand that the marriage between one man and one woman, which was designed to be, Two virgins consummating a blood covenant because at consummation, the bride's blood is spilled over the member of the man, therefore forming a covenant to death. And that's why we say, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. That's why God said, I hate divorce. Now, if you're divorced in here, it's not the unpardonable sin. Just don't do it again. <laughs> don't just jump into a marriage saying, well, if it don't work out. No, no, no. You don't ever go into a marriage saying, well, if it don't work out. You go into a marriage saying, this is my choice. Like it or not, this is what I live with from now till death do us part. You say, well, a lot of people don't do that, Dave, and they're still in church and they're still going to heaven. I'm like, you're right. But why not go the better way? Why not go the better way? It's the blood. It's the blood. It's the blood. The, 
He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Every sin that a man does is outside of his body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? You are bought with a price. I'm just free to be me. No, you're not. You sold your soul to Almighty God. After he redeemed your soul from the devil. It was still you who said, I'll take the cup. Here's what you don't understand. Every time, every month when we do communion in here. And we take the cup and we take the bread. What we're doing is remembering the day we said yes to our groom as his bride. We just remember it. You know how you get out your wedding pictures? Oh, remember that? Man, look how skinny you used to be. Oh, snap. Might as well put your wedding dress on eBay because it ain't going to fit no more. I'm just kidding. I had to lighten you up a little bit. <laughs> she said, we're going to have to find a smaller man for them tucks. Amen. Because you got old furniture disease. Your chest done fell down in your drawers. Amen. You... <laughs> well, what we're doing is every day, every time we take, take, eat, this is my, we're remembering the day that he thrust the cup. He said, you've heard the agreement. You repent of your sins and you live for me until death and you're honoring me until death and you're loyal to me until death. That's your covenant. And every month, we take the cup. We're remembering our covenant. We're remembering our covenant. We're remembering. I can't just decide whether I want to do it or not. You know what? I learned this a long time ago. A lot of people have an attitude in church. I can walk up to a man, and I've done this. I've tested people. And I've said, what would you do if the woman of your dreams came up to you and said, I'm yours now? And you know how many men I've had look at me and go, hmm, I don't know. I said, no, you just told me what you'd do. Because that decision was made when you took the cup. What if you walked up to a lady and you said, that knuckle-dragging husband of yours, that neon to thrall with clothes on? What if the man of your dreams came and said, leave that bum, and I will take care of you as a queen for the rest of your life? What would you do? And if she says, hmm, man, well, I'd like to think that I wouldn't. No, you already answered. You're not a covenant person. You're a convenient person. This ain't a covenant of convenience. This isn't a covenant of what this will do until something better comes along. You know what Christianity has been melted down to in America? Life enhancement. We even try to witness to people. You know, you're having a bad time, huh? Well, come to Jesus. He'll make it better. That ain't witnessing. You know what we say to them? You think it's bad now? Wait till you go to the devil's hell. Wait till you cast into the lake of fire, you dirty, rotten worm. Well, you hurt my self-esteem. That's the problem. You have too much self-esteem. You don't understand. You're worthless. And unless you get bought by blood, you'll always be worthless. And unless you can offer the blood. So many people say, why should you go to heaven? How many people actually say because of the blood? Not very many. Go out there and try it. 
Just go out there this week and walk up people you work with. And you say, hey, can I ask you a random question? They say, yes. If you died and you were at heaven's gate and an angel asked you, why should I let you in? And you, even people who call themselves Christians, look at what they say. Most of them will say, well, I'm a good person. No, you're not. There's none good but God. I cringed when I heard Joel Osteen make the statement, 99.9% of the people you know are really good people with good hearts. They've just made a few mistakes. What Bible are you reading? Why do you want to sit there and tell sinners they're not? That's why they have no honor of the blood. They don't think they need blood. Because in their mind, I'm a good person. Why? Because I've done more good than bad. But the Bible refutes that whole argument and says if you've broken one jot or tittle of the law, you're guilty of the whole law. That means if you lied, you're an adulterer and a murderer. It means if you stole a paper clip, you're a drunkard and a thief. You're guilty of all of it if you've broken one point. And that's why we can just say, if, if you ask me, how are you getting in? I'm going to say the blood. Amen. Or I might answer this way, the gift of righteousness, which is appropriated by the blood. You can't have a gift of righteousness without shedding of blood. There's no remission. We just read that. Acts 20, 28. Therefore, Take heed to yourselves. You watch your worship. You watch your worship. You watch what you sell out next Sunday's worship for. People say, well, going to church ain't that important. No, it ain't if you're not under the blood. Amen. You're right. It's not. It's just a ritual unless you come in here with the blood. Amen. And then it's very important. There are pastors all over the land saying, well, you know, we probably won't ever open our churches back up. That's all right. We'll take your people, you backslidden babies. Amen. We'll take your people. Let them come over here and get behind a shepherd with a backbone. Get behind a shepherd with a blood-stained heart. We'll take your people. I think McDonald's still has a few franchises for sale. You could probably gather up the little money your church has left and go buy into that and have yourself some security. I don't want to reduce Jesus' blood to take out. This ain't take out church. There's a difference between committing yourself to sit down and eat a meal and getting take out. When you're making me feel bad, Pastor Dave, I'm watching online and I'm not there. Why? <laughs> Only you and God can determine if what you're doing is righteous or not. I can't determine that. I'm not judging you. I'm telling you what Jesus Christ said as a standard. You take heed to yourself. And he said to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. You preachers that are scared to have church, you better take heed to yourselves. This video will make it to some of you. Well, I just don't think it's that important we come to church. You know, I can serve God in my house. Then why did he say in his word on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, the disciples gathered together and brought forth their tithes and offerings for increase and worship? And then he went on to say, and do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, come on. Peter Pan's preaching down the street if you don't like this. <laughs> and Peter Pan will take you to Never Never Land. Where you will never cast out a devil. You will never heal the sick. You will never stand boldly and witness to your generation. You will never pray in tongues. You will never give a prophetic word. Because you under Peter Pan at the land for lost boys. Yeah. 
You shouldn't talk about other preachers. Why? Jesus did. Scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Hypocrites. To shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. You know, we're very graceful in this church. Even though it's a hard preaching, you know me. I don't think you'll find a more forgiving, graceful man anywhere on the planet. And if you do, I'm going to be like him. If you find someone that's more forgiving and more graceful and more willing to, to restore and to love and to forgive than me, then point him to me because I want to learn from him and then I'm going to become like him and then there won't be no more like that. Because that's how I want to live. But that's not in the compromising of the power of the blood. That's not into falsely securing people in their own idolatry and sin. And their own self-deception. Thank you, sir. (laughs) Revelation 5, 9. I'm at an hour and eight minutes. You know what they tell you in Bible college? No, you can't preach more than 20 minutes. No, you can't because you got nothing to say, dumb dumb. You can't preach more than 20 minutes because you're so stinking boring in your compromised delivery, people won't even sit for 20 minutes. They'll be trying to teach in children's church to get out of your preaching. I was in a church one time with a dead pastor. I'd been asked to come and preach, and I walked in there, and when they dismissed the kids, almost the entire congregation went out. And I had to run to the little boys' room, and I'm running down the hall, and sitting in the nursery are four adults and one baby. So I began to question. And I said, why did everybody leave? And this is what they said. We'd rather go work in children's church and have to listen to another message from this guy because he is so boring. You know what they ought to take with the preachers that can't hold a congregation for more than 20 minutes? They ought to call them what they really are, deacons. And they ought to demote the deacons back into helping someone that has the gifting to teach the Bible build a great church. But instead, they become deacon-possessed churches. They gather up a few wounded saints and call themselves a church. There's no government. There's no power. There's no accountability. Anyway. (laughs) Revelation 5, 9. And they sang a song, a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open open its seals, for you were slain. And have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you've made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on earth. Well, my message is at least getting to Chicago because I just got a message from Chicago. Good preaching this morning. (laughs) Thank you. Because all the wimp pastors in Chicago aren't having church. Okay, priests and kings. Are you acting like priests and kings? Come on up, guys. Are you acting like priests and kings? I guess an hour and 15 minutes is enough. I know 80% of you would stay here with me to 3 o'clock, and that's why I love you. And that's why you love me. But I'm not going to do that just to prove that. I, I know there are times we hit saturation points. I get the same way when people are preaching to me. I'm like, okay, I'm done. I can't take any more right now. I need to go process I pray to God you're processing this message this week. I pray you start seeing the blood everywhere you go. I pray every time 
you turn on a program or every time you listen to music, ask yourself, is that music worthy of the blood? Is that music worthy of the blood? Is that program, is that worthy of the blood? Yeah, but I'm bored. I'd rather be bored than to dishonor the blood. Americans are bored because of where we are as a nation. That's where we are as a nation. Father, I pray over this house this morning. I pray over every person that's watching online. And I pray that your shepherds would begin to rise up and say, if this nation wants to go to hell, it can, but we're not going with it. If this nation wants to take God's covenant rainbow and put it over homosexuals, they have their own covenant. It's with the devil. That's why the color purple was left out of the homosexual rainbows, because that's the royalty of God. If you want to sell the blood for what so-called social justice, which is mostly just a lie, and a reason for a bunch of rebels to become anarchists that want to destroy your freedom to worship God. Because that's the end game. That's the end game of this thing. Marxism, you got to remember, it's rooted in what is called atheism. No belief in God. And the only way we can really get this nation turned around to the way the anarchists want it, the socialists, the communists, the Marxists, the only way we can do it is just shut the church up. And we got gagged pastors all over this nation doing their little 10 minute thing online that nobody's watching. There's a big article out two weeks ago that said the millennials have stopped attending online church. Within 10 weeks of COVID-19 church shutdown, 45% of people had stopped watching their church online. 45% within 10 weeks. Now we're up to, what, five months? And so the latest ad is millennials are no longer attending online church because it ain't real. Legalism, defined by some, is trying to live holy. Trying to live holy, defined by others like me, is honoring the blood that I was bought with and not counting it a common thing. I'm not going to count the blood a common thing. As we stand together and we transition this service, I pray that every person in this room receives my revelation. Holy Spirit, you're so, you're so more than enough. We don't need this world. We need you. We don't need the pleasures this world offers. We need you. Someone just told me the other day, said, well, I was so busy Saturday, I was too tired to come to church on Sunday. Well, what were you doing on Saturday? I was at the mall. So you were so busy playing in the world on Saturday, you were too tired to go to church on Sunday. Is that honoring the blood? Is that honoring the blood? When you got pastors 
who don't think church is important. God help the, sh the sheep. When you got shepherds, God help the sheep. Backslidden shepherds are the problem with our nation. I don't blame the congressmen and the senators or even the president. I blame the preachers that are afraid to stand up and tell their people the truth. And man pleasing preachers that are afraid to tell people the truth. They'd rather sit home and do nothing. Jesus. I pray there's some preachers that see this video that your blood is boiling. Good. I pray that God conviction will get to your heart and you'll honor the blood again. You'll honor the blood again. Your blood speaks a better word than all the empty claims I've heard upon this earth. Speaks righteousness for me. It stands in my defense. Jesus, it's your blood. Oh, oh. 
Somebody got it. Somebody got it. Hallelujah. Man. I hope you've all, uh, like I say, do, do me the favor. Ask a few folks this week. If you think I'm lying to you, just ask some folks. If you die and you get to heaven's gate and the angel asks you, why should you come in and see how many answer you the blood? Because any other answer is wrong. Any other answer is self-righteousness. That's true legalism, is self-righteousness. That's true legalism. You'll be shocked. You'll be shocked. Thank you for coming this morning. Thank you for listening. Thank you for receiving. Thank you for encouraging back. Every amen means something. Our prayer team's coming up front right now. If you got something you need to put under the blood today, come up and get prayer. If you need something that you need to put the blood on today, come up and get prayer. We love you. Have an awesome, awesome rest of the day in Jesus.